Hello, and welcome to Makers on Tap, the podcast where makerspace directors drink and talk about making stuff. Tonight, I'm your host, Joe, and with me are... Aaron. Chris. And Dominic. Dominic, if you guys don't remember, was on the show a few months ago. He's from Darkly Labs. And uh, what are you guys all drinking tonight? Uh, I had the wonderful opportunity to have to drive down to St. Louis. So while I was down there, uh, I picked me up some uh, Four Hands Warhammer Imperial IPA. Uh, and nice. mainly because I just saw the label for this and I loved it. It says, Columbus Tomahawk Zeus is an Imperial IPA, hoppy with variants of in the Warhammer, as well as in, in the inspirational name. We use a combination of North Pacific, Pacific Northwest hops to create to create layers of pungent flavor. Uh, yeah, I've already had a little bit. Sorry. <laughs> a generous malt bill adds to the biscuit and the honey notes that while allowing the hops to take the center stage. Warhammer pours out a golden color with aromas such as pineapple, mango, tangerine, raisin, and slight earthy tones. Damn. And boy is it delicious. <laughs> You know, every time you talk about your beer, I get more mad that we don't record together. <laughs> I have all the good stuff because I just travel like stupid. Yeah. Aaron, what are you drinking? Since we uh, just wrapped up an hour worth of technical difficulties. <laughs> yeah, that's why we're all a little toasty. I'm on my second gumball head <laughs> oh, from Three Floyds. Okay. Tom, what do you have? Well, I'm probably the most exciting one tonight. I have an espresso ristretto um, with some moo juice. Did you say Nespresso? Ooh. Yeah, it's a coffee, basically. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Josh had that at Makerfest, and that was, uh, or not Makerfest, Rep Rep Fest, and that was yeah. really good to try. Yeah. Yeah, that kept us all going. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> And then I am drinking our favorite brewery industry, their No Call No Show. I'm killing off a crowler that's been hanging off out in my fridge for a few weeks now, and pretty happy about it. Yum yum. Thanks thanks to that hour of technical difficulties, I'm well into the crowler. <laughs> I'm getting less done tonight than I hoped. All right. So uh next uh, we have one news topic for tonight because we want to cover a little bit of our project update. So, Aaron, what's your news topic? Unity 3D, most known for their uh, gaming engine, just announced on their blog that they are now officially supporting Linux for their uh, Unity engine client. They are shooting for Ubuntu 16.04 and 18.04, CentOS 7, both 86 and 64-bit architecture, the GNOME desktop environment, uh, NVIDIA proprietary graphics driver and the AMD Mesa graphics driver. Mm. So up until now, they've had a Linux client, but it was an experimental version and they never, they didn't give uh, official support for it. Whereas now, you know, you get the full support from the manufacturer for any issues with the software. And that's just really exciting. Which this is, this has been a really good week for Linux because um, Dell just released their new laptop that they're premiering with Linux on it, um, which is kind of cool as well. Like it, there. Yeah. So the project Sputnik just got some updates with uh, the newest uh, precision chassis, which is really exciting. Nice. Yeah. And this, uh, like, for those who don't know, Unity is used for a good amount. Just beside, like, not even all just gaming. Uh, Unity is just a really good engine to build a whole lot of stuff on. Um, in fact, I actually ran into somebody last night who was building a AR uh, client on or with Unity. So they were building it so you could scan a business card um, and then it would have AR information pop off that with your smartphone. Um, and huh. yeah, it was kind of cool. Um, he had broken it right before he uh, went out for the night, and so he wasn't able to show me exactly how it worked. But he explained the whole process of it to me, and it was it was a very cool idea. Um, he basically he's inspiring to be the guy who develops 
the browser for AR, essentially. Um, yeah, because, like, there is no, like, actual unified AR, like, identifier, I guess you could say. Um, everything's just kind of, like, in their own proprietary way. You have to open up their app or whatnot. So he essentially wants to be the Chrome of the AR world. Nice. And go for it dude like it ambitious yeah he's he's got a lot of goals um but hey i mean if it works for him it works for him like yeah it would be cool but yeah That's so awesome. this is a like unity coming to linux is huge cuz like as much as i love gaming and gaming is a huge sphere within unity unity can be used for a whole bunch besides gaming and that'll be really cool to have it on the platform yeah, we, we I remember back um a few years ago we had a um we we're working on a TV commercial with motion capture and what they did was they 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 captured the performers doing the motion capture, um and then they used Unity um the director would have a virtual view viewpoint into the a virtual camera in Unity and he would control the filming camera virtually based around the motion capture happening so um it, it was kind of just a it was a really unusual combination of uses for the for unity it's such an awesome awesome package nice and it's that's really cool yeah it, it that's what's so cool about unity is it's just it's such a versatile program because like normally you would take something like that and you could you could import all that data into something like maya or and do it that way but like unity is just like so it's like Blender in some ways, but like it's just a very versatile package that you can do a lot of stuff with. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely cool to see it heading to heading to have full support on Linux for sure. That's our our news area wrapped up. Chris, do you want to start us off with some project updates? Sure. Um, so I haven't had a whole lot of stuff on my plate recently. Um, project wise, life wise, yes, very much. Um, but I recently got my first motorcycle. Um, I was all excited about that. Um, it's basically terrifying. <laughs> um, there's several different reasons that I wanted to get a motorcycle, but the main one being, um, eventually I would like to actually go to an electric motorcycle and I would like to actually have that be my full-time commuter. Um, when those fully come to the market and are able to make a big splash, um, so I'm kind of getting ready and getting back onto bikes to be able to feel comfortable for when I eventually go out and drop a stupid amount of money on an electric motorcycle, because I'd rather not dump that. <laughs> so, um, with buying a used motorcycle comes a lot of new challenges, um, because like, it's a whole new thing. When you bought your first car, uh, you had a whole bunch of new stuff that you had to learn how to do with that. Um, so my first project this week was to try and tackle, uh, motorcycle audio and I halfway succeeded and I halfway like ran into a hurdle that I can't do anything about. Um, I had to basically, um, put a switch in line, uh, for it. And it was really kind of fun learning, uh, the whole path of like the audio that went through it and the power and all that to the point of where like. I was so in rhythm with my work um, and at work, everything uh, with red and black runs in parallel. And so um, I was running parallel for the power to the, um, to the actual amplifier and yeah, ran through parallel through a switch and that wasn't good. <laughs> that was a, uh, it was just out of habit. Totally. Didn't realize what I was doing. And uh, one of the guys in this space was there talking to me while I was doing it. And all of a sudden I put it on and I was like, oh, like everything heated up. And I was like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> and then I like ripped it off and I was like, what the? F ah. <laughs> so luckily everything was safe and it worked completely fine. But it was just that minute of just like, yeah, I just got a little too cocky and didn't like look at my stuff before I was done. <laughs> Hey, and hey, uh hey. accidentally wired power in parallel and that was never not, done that it never oh, done that. <laughs> hey, at least you didn't let the magic smoke out that's the best thing oh yeah, yeah. no it was 
<laughs> you could um I was looking at the wires afterwards and there's definitely some like <laughs> waxing marks on the plastic and I'm like oh yeah that was gonna go that was that was very much gonna go had I left it any longer uh, it's, it's, uh, fun, it's yeah. funny you, you get that you get that kind of smell and it, your brain reacts like that that sh nothing should be smelling like that right yeah I mean do we have nothing time? good ever comes after the smell <laughs> do, <laughs> I would like I know you two have heard the story but I have Dominic and I kind of want to tell him the story of like a little bit about my job. Do you, do we have time? Uh, yeah, we're I'd thirteen love... minutes into the episode. I'd okay, love to hear. Okay, that. so uh, <laughs> so I work um, I work for a company that does uh, projection equipment, and um, and I have a lot of fun with that. And so one of my favorite stories is uh, the time that I had to put out one of our projectors while it was on fire. Um, <laughs> So I'm walking up in one of in one of the booths, and uh, I start smelling that smell, the the carbon smell. It's a very distinct, yeah. rough smell. So I'm like running around down there, and I'm trying to figure it all out. And I run up the the ladder because I'm like, well, I can't figure it out. So maybe I can smell from the exhaust ports if it's coming from one of those. So I'm at the exhaust ports, still can't smell anything. Come back down the ladder off the roof, and like the entire booth now smells like this. Like something's going wrong. Walk past one of the projectors, and sure enough, there is just a orange flicker coming from within one of the projectors. Oh, Keep in mind, this thing is still showing a movie. <laughs> it's still on screen. Like that, they, it was going. I literally had to go hit the breakers from the wall, grab a fire extinguisher, and put that thing out. To this day, I've said to our PR people, I'm like, if we ever need a story about how good our projectors are, just quote me that one of our projectors was running while still on fire. Right, like, all right. <laughs> Classic. Classic. Oh, yeah. No, it was great. <laughs> but, <laughs> that is my side rant for electrical fires. Oh, man. That is. <laughs> so you, you, had a, I, you have, like, multiple projectors in case that happens, or what, what, what happens? You just oh no, that was down. That said, that like it was, if once I turned that we had to order a new line filter. It was the two twenty coming into the projector, so I had to order a whole new bunch of stuff in order to get it back up and running. It, it like damn. that theater was down for at least three days. <laughs> oh, not good. I, I can't believe you just had to order parts and it, the whole thing wasn't just trash. Oh no, it was it was very like segmented to the damage. I had to do a little bit of rewiring, but like. Um, it was mainly the line filter that kind of just cleared up the 220 that was going in there that I just had to replace that and then uh, a couple of the couplings and it was fine. Like, I, that's the one thing, man. I will. Our projectors are built like tanks. Wow. They are very much like they're full metal. They're full like steel. They'll stand up to a fire. Like there's that that one projector is still out in the field. It's still running. Um, and every once in a while I go and I, I'll take pictures of like the soot damage that is on like the, the rim of the top. And it's just like, oh yeah, it's still there. Like it's, it's just <laughs> going to be there forever. <laughs> like <laughs> That's amazing. But oh, that's yeah. awesome. <laughs> All right. Well, Aaron, how are you doing? What's up with your projects? After last week's episode, Devin kind of got me fired up to get uh, the, the access control system working. And my biggest roadblock now is that all I have is that one uh, proto board wired uh, example. And I'm pretty sure that is what burnt out the last ESP32 I had in there. Ah. So I think the problem is just my board. So what I, what I want to do is get an actual circuit board put, put together for it. Like a, just a standard through hole using, you know, female headers just so I can just like s swap things in and out of. Right. But I don't know how to make circuit boards. This past week, I've been looking into different EDAs to try and do it. My my initial thought was using KiCad. What's what's an EDA? It's like an electronics design something. Okay. It's, okay. It, it's like a PCB electronic schematic software. Uh, my my first thought was KiCad, but after going through some, some tutorials, it seems like very obtuse. Like as a programmer, watching the t tutorials. It seems very well segmented to like make your stuff, but then like once you make a library, you, you know, you save it, then you have to go into another window, re-import it, 
or maybe like run manually click a button to you know sync then upload it or or add it like, there's a lot of stuff that's like why isn't that just done automatically like if you're just going to do it why isn't that just done for you a lot a lot of stuff like that um probably just because it's you know open source software but um i don't have a lot of free time anymore so i don't know if i'm gonna have enough time to actually learn how to use keycad quickly um i've been listening to a lot of podcasts a lot of software startup podcasts and like the the common theme is that most startups only fail because they f don't get to market quickly enough and so that's what yep. i'm trying to do is like i know i'm a huge fan for of open source and i want to do as much open source as possible but i also just want to get this done so i don't know if i'm going to do it in keycad i've been looking at easy eda which is a, a web-based uh, schematic software from jlpcb they do a uh, pcb custom order stuff okay. i'm starting to look into that because as a it now has a nice uh web interface before it looked really bad but now um, they redid it recently it looked really nice and then it looks pretty simple to just poke around and figure it out so i'm giving myself like a month to get that done if i don't get it done in a month i'm going to look into something like fiverr to have somebody do it for me you know, we have friends who design PCBs, right? I'm just putting that out there, that we, we know people that are electrical engineers that design PCBs for a living and would take this on, probably. I might have to do that then. I'm, I'm just saying. I'm giving myself a month because I, I, I want to know how to do it. You know, I want to be able right. to like no, come, up with a, come up with an idea. And like this entire thing is simple. Like I'm the electrical engineer. The, this whole access control system, like the actual thing is just, fairly simple circuit but i just want to know how to be able to throw it together but if i can't get it done in a month i want to just like have somebody do it because i don't want to like put it off for too long like what josh ended up doing was he designed a circuit board for uh the electronics control system for the chase vans for the saint jude run and uh, blew up some components and then emailed this friend and was like what did i do wrong and then they sat down on the phone for a couple of hours and he sorted them out, sent it off for the second generation boards and those ended up working. So mm -hmm. like Josh still learned a ton and then learned way more by, you know, doing the work, failing and then asking for advice rather than just sending it off. So like that could be an option for this. Yeah. Like I said, it's you know, all going to come down to time. Yeah, maybe maybe in like two and a half weeks, you can you can email him and be like, "Hey, take a look at this for me, real quick," because he's pretty good at this. Okay. You know who I'm talking about. I'm yeah. just not gonna ring him up here. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I know. <laughs> you don't want to yeah, dump that, anyone in. <laughs> yeah, I, I I I don't want him to suddenly get inundated with phone calls of like, "Hey, I need help with this PCB," and I heard uh, on. Uh, Makers on tap that you do this? This is a thing you do? Because <laughs> he definitely wouldn't do it for everybody, but he would do it for us. So, yeah. Uh, Dom, you have any project updates? What's going on in, in the, in the Australian world? I, in the I, great down under. Oh, it's getting cold here. Um, I, I wish I had a good project to describe, but um, we, we had a, a problem come up recently, uh, about two weeks ago, where our laser uh, our laser units go through our, our build process and they're, they're they're checked along the way and they have to meet certain requirements and and one of those requirements is their focal range and we started to have a lot of failures with these um with these units um and there was no clear reason for it they were almost kind of random um, you know, let, let's just say their focus range had to be within, you know, um, plus or minus two. They were all of a sudden minus eight, plus ten. Um, all these really wacky, uh, wacky um, values. Um, and you know, uh, cutting it down to to weeks of trying to find what the problem was, we actually found that um, one of our final focusing lenses was being manufactured out of spec um and it's kind of nice. it's kind of nice. interesting it, it's it, it seems yeah it seems like uh you know you can <laughs> you can easily check for that but um the these lenses are kind of interesting they're they're made out of a special glass 
it's not you know there's a I don't know what the, the name is but it's a special optical glass the the surfaces have a certain shape so they'll have a mm -hmm. certain curvature on the top and a certain curvature on the bottom and the lens is a certain thickness um, all, all this matched up we checked all these we we were able to to check these so in part it looked like this wasn't the problem but what actually happens with these lenses is they're made in a mold and the density of the material in the lens uh, varies across the, the the lens itself so what was actually happening the, the molds were a little bit worn after after prolonged use and they were affecting the actual density inside the lens itself um, which in turn Hi. which would in turn affect the you know the refractive index and the way the light bends passes through the surface so um, took, yeah. it took us a while to find that but it was, it was kind of interesting at the end of the day thinking oh, wow you know there's a, there's a there's a lot of stuff that goes into this um, but it was kind of interesting yeah that's that's kind of my awesomely fun project I had to deal with um, <laughs> 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 so so did you did you have to end up calling the supplier and being like hey you know our, our our focuses are out i need you to go check your tooling yeah or yeah so we okay. we, we we exhausted everything at our end that we could um you know we, we thought okay maybe our machines uh, uh you know part of our machines being manufactured too high or too low or something's wrong with one of our pieces of test equipment that we collimate our beam with uh, but no it all kind of all checked out um and we went back to them and they were able to verify that yeah their, their lenses were out of spec um which you know unfortunately means you know a few weeks of delay but um getting to get into the bottom of stuff like that is sometimes just so tricky so tricky um yeah. you know you kind of sit down and you think man there's got to be an easier, easier job in life, you know. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> but you know, like that's why uh, your lens or your lasers are, you know, as high a quality as they are because you guys are checking that. Yeah, like yeah, that, yeah. I, that's what sets. Who are you? Why are you here? I just real quick. It's been so long since we had you on. Um, I think it's been at least 20 episodes since you've been on. So like, can you give us a real quick synopsis of yeah. who you are and why? Sorry. So I'm, we should have done that at the beginning. I'm Bob. <laughs> I'm a recovering maker. Um... <laughs> Hi, Bob. <laughs> Keep Please. coming back. Please. <laughs> it only works if you work it. <laughs> um, no, it's um, Dominic from Darkly Labs. We, um, we make uh, desktop laser cutters. We, we make the emblazer range. Um, we've we've spoken about that little bit of a uh, little bit in the past. We're based in Australia and you know, kind of a, a dedicated team of, of makers and and tinkerers and experimenters. We you know we decided to have this great idea of putting a company together um, in 2013, and um, yeah, things have been going really really good for us recently. So uh, that's that's kind of our our background. You know, at, at heart we're we're makers. Where we like to do stuff and we like to experiment um, when, um, as you guys know, when time permits, when, when your right. job doesn't get in the way. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Pretty much. Awesome. Thank you for doing the synopsis again. I, That's okay. I, I know somebody will find value in it. Sure. Um, <laughs> Joe, what about you? What have you been working on? Uh, so personally, I've been working on a couple things i'm trying to get my mill running again and uh, i learned the other day that no matter how good of a saw blade you have on your bandsaw you shouldn't try to cut a tap out that you broke because it won't work oh, yeah that was a really good tap apparently you don't really say. good blade i had in my bandsaw just doesn't cut anything anymore so that's <laughs> um and Aside from that, I started a couple of weeks ago building a uh, humongous CNC router. Uh, the goal for this router is that it will have two gantries. That one will have a CNC router on it, and then the other gantry will have a laser cutter on it. 
and I should be able to laser etch and CNC route a full four by eight sheet of plywood. Wow. Um, Damn. Yeah, that's fun. Right? <laughs> uh, and I haven't decided yet on the laser side if it's going to be a low wattage CO2 or a higher wattage uh, diode laser. Um, I'm kind of debating on the diode uh, just because there's just so much less to deal with. Oh, and yeah. For the stuff that I need to do, like, I'm not going to be cutting anything on this. It will all be anything that needs to be cut will be done on the router head. So I just need to etch reasonably quick and I can etch just as fast on my M blazers as I can on my 80 watt CO2 laser it, pretty close. So, it, but I get higher definition on the M blazers. So I think, I think I might go with a diode head on this thing. I don't know. We'll Ooh. see. Definitely takes up a lot less space, which really a lot less space and a lot less weight. Like, well, I I don't have to carry around water hoses. I don't have to carry around high voltage wires yeah. because like if I build this thing with a CO2 tube, it will be the tube will be mounted on the cantry. I'm not going to try to align a 19 foot beam. <laughs> right. Like just not happening. So the tube would be would be gantry mounted and the cooling would probably have to be gantry mounted. I don't know. It might just be really long hoses, but the power supply would definitely be gantry. I don't I really don't want to mount all of that on the gantry and then figure out the right way to deal with the noise and everything that would come along with that. So electrical noise, not like loudness. Uh, so yeah, that's what I've been working on for the last couple of weeks. And um, everyone in the world will be angry to know that I <laughs> built the base out of wood and not steel <laughs> and, ah! not extrusions and not um, all of the things that everyone will yell at me about. And you know why? Because damn it, I know I can. Uh, the, the reality is, uh, I was going to build it out of uh, steel, uh, uh, inch and a half box section or two inch box section. Um, but what it really came down to was to do it in steel, I needed um, a very large weld table to keep everything square that I don't have access to anymore. I needed a welder friend who is a much better welder than me that I have less access to. Uh, to build it out of extrusion would have cost seven times more. Um, wow. The, literally uh, one of the long sections of extrusion that I would have used cost more than the entire base. And I needed three of those long sections um, and like six shorter ones. It, yeah. Seven times was up was the cost and to build everything from wood. I can do it. Um, and I know how to brace things in a way that are just as strong as steel. And my CNC router that I have been running for seven years is built out of almost entirely plywood. And everybody told me that it wouldn't work. And everybody told me that it would be garbage. I think that's aluminum, almost as good as the Tormach mill that we ran at work. So, like, you build it right, it's going to work okay. <laughs> Which and I can attest that thing is built freaking solid, like it's nice. Yeah. So and all, you know, it's, all you're it, gonna do is put up with people calling you grandpa. That's all. I people call me a lot of things. Um, it, when I built that original router, that was back when C and C Zone was like the only resource on the internet for yeah. things, and it's about as good as the machinist forms. Um, or practical machinist forms for getting abused on the internet for having ideas yeah. that are different than the other old guys. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at with all of that. Pretty cool. Why, why, why not? We, um, we, we had a, we had a massive, um, router at a company and the, the guy who designed it came in and repaired it once and we were chatting about it and they said, once they build the, um, the frame they actually stick the frame into a into a massive oven and they they heat it up and let it um let all the stresses in it um relax 
and then they take it out yeah. and they remachine it flat again. Um, and this was a big machine. So, um, yeah. yeah, you're dealing with lots of stuff when you start dealing with metal. Um, yeah. It, it, the, the wood beams they built the base out of, they're called LSL, uh, laminated strand lumber. Uh, and they're they're essentially two by fours made out of OSB, and they build um, uh, they do foundation rimming with them, and they're starting to use them in studs, in uh, prefab housing. Right. And you know they're engineered to stay straight. They're engineered to fight moisture. They're engineered to do exactly what I need them to do, and with the bracing that I've added and the bracing that I still plan to add. Uh, the thing is just stout. Like I could probably leave it the way it is and it would be okay. But I just, I have a couple more things to add and it will be very stiff. So Damn. you don't like to do anything to have... small, do you? you everything. Huh? You don't like to make small things. You, you go big, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, the plan for this is to build furniture. I've had a two foot by four foot router for a long time and I've built a lot of great things on it. And everybody just wants something a little bit bigger than I can make. Mm. So, and I've got things that are just a little bit bigger than I can make. So, um, I had access to a four foot by eight foot router and now I don't. And I really, really miss it. The only thing that I won't be able to do with this that I couldn't, could do on that one is, uh, that one had an eight tool changer on it. Mm. And, uh, I really want that again. I, recently found a company based in Tennessee that has an affordable uh, tool changer spindle that I might convert to later on. It's about $2,000. Um, but you can, uh, it's five, five horsepower, I think, which is a little less than I had before, but five horsepower, which is two more horsepower than I have now. And uh, it takes ISO 30 taper tools. So, like a standard industrial uh, machining taper. Mm, nice. So it could be really, really fun to have that. We'll see. It'll all be Linux CNC driven, of course. Nice. <laughs> of course. Get one of those terminals. You could have thrown you did it right, there somewhere. Sitting right well. there. I took your terminal too, by the way, Chris. Did, were you the one who took it? Okay. Nice. Yeah. I'm not letting that go to rate waste. <laughs> So, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. So, um, does anyone else have any updates they want to add? Any comments on projects before we dive in? I was gonna say, Joe. I think it would be a good topic one day to to cover is how to design machines using wood. Because oh, that'd be fun. I, I think a lot of your a lot of the criticism for your for your choice to use wood is probably just out of not knowing how to design machines for using wood. Mm. You know. That could be. It's a good point. Yeah, a, a lot of the people that have poo-pooed it, uh, I tell them how I'm building it and why I'm going about it the way that they're just like, yeah, well, I just I just don't trust wood and I just <laughs> I just can't see how that's going to work. <laughs> It'll, 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 sure. it'll, yeah, it'll smile at you and stab you in the back at the same time. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. It, it, you know, that's totally fine. Like, I, I'm the same way when I see weldments. I'm like, there's no way that weldment can be square. But I know that it can be because, like, I've, I've worked in, like, industrial weldments and I've done things with it where I know that they can be square. It's just the reality of getting things square is like, like you said, Dominic, like having to put it into a heat treat oven and then relax everything and then remachine it. Like that's, that's a reality. So, yeah. um, I, I have a ton of ideas on building small routers with weldments, but using, utilizing a bigger machine to weld, to machine everything flat and square and then assembly it. So this is something you might take past um, just a just a machine for yourself. You think? No. <laughs> <Not much chance. laughs> um, I have too many friends like you, Dominic, that have uh, have built machines 
for the public and I see what you guys go through. And you guys are just special people to be able to, <laughs> to do that and like still love humanity. Uh. And it, the reality is I would love to utilize my talents to help amazing people like you guys succeed, but never do I want to be the, the person that the public is directly criticizing and beating up because they can't figure out how to use the thing that I made as easy as possible to use. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Good, good, um, good approach. I think good approach. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. At, at some point, maybe I, I have, I have so many ideas. I, I don't know that I could stick with an idea long enough to bring it to the market before I got bored and frustrated with it. Um, I don't know if I if I have the wherewithal. Maybe <laughs> we'll figure that out one day. Maybe. Um, all right. So, speaking of uh, Joe not having the attention span to finish things, <laughs> nice segue, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the topic for tonight is uh, getting sidetracked in the path to a project. So you have an idea in your head. And halfway through that, you need a tool to actually accomplish your goal or you need a skill to accomplish your goal. So you, you veer off and you go down that path to try to attain that skill or that tool. And then do you ever get back to the original project? I don't know. I sure haven't. Uh, <laughs> Dominic, you brought up this idea. <laughs> Do you want to do you want to segue into it? Oh man, yeah, this is like this is this is so many makers life, isn't it? Um It is. It totally totally is. And I think look, I it's a good thing. Um you know, Aaron you're talking about going off and and learning how to do PCB design, you know? That's that's yeah. just that's just what we love to do, right? Um uh, it's it's a learning process and it and it's what takes our our interest at the time and motivates us and keeps us from sitting on the sofa and, and watching tv uh but yeah the, the the one that comes to mind for me is uh, it was probably about 12 years ago i uh, I, I used to like making model airplanes you know fl flying airplanes so i decided to like, make like real ones not river, not like remote control ones remote control so okay. Um, okay. So I decided to um, jump in and make a, um, a re remote control, radio controlled glider. And rather than do the traditional balsa wood and, and covering, I decided to look into how to do how to make a composite model using um, fiberglass, carbon fiber, resins, all those sort of um, materials. So I found a really good design, and the first thing you you've got to make is the wing. So the wings generally are um, a foam core um, wing, and, and they're coated with fiberglass or, or some sort of some sort of coating. Um, so I decided, well, the first thing I need is a way to cut the airfoil out of the foam core. So obviously, um, you need a CNC hot wire cutter. You know, there's yeah, you no, do. there's of no, of course other, you do. There's no other way you can do it. So I've, I've probably <laughs> spent about six months. Um, building a, a CNC hot wire cutter, uh, which which kind of worked really well. Um, it was probably way overkill for what I needed, but uh, it was a great learning experience, you know, computer controlled, all that sort of stuff. It, could cut, it, could, it was a two axis, so it could cut different airfoil um, on, on either side of, um, of your, yeah, yeah, it was uh, just a, a, a wire that, um, sorry about that. Um, so that, that all went well. And then, you know, you start to cut your wings and you realize, you know, wings are really long, thin panels. So you start to realize, you know, what happens is when you heat up a wire in a wire cutter, the wire expands. Um, and, as, and as you're cutting through material, um, part of the wire is hotter than the other part of the wire. So... Um, what starts to happen is you start to get the wire curving inside the foam. So you're not getting really straight, clean cuts. So obviously what you need is you need a way to um, tension this wire. You know, you, you know, when it's really hot and it stretches, you want to tighten it up a little bit more. So 
you know, obviously the easiest way is to develop a, um, uh, an Arduino based um, system that that measures the length of the wire um, as it gets hotter and then, you know, tweaks it, adjusts it and keeps it at the same tension all the time. So what else would you do? How, how did it measure the length of the wire? Did it, did it like check resistance or? Yeah. So we, um, let's see, I had a, um, I had a potentiometer that was, that had a pulley on it and the wire went around the pulley, the pulley had a, and that had a spring, so it was spring loaded. So as the wire stretched, the the spring would take up the stretch, but it would also turn the potentiometer, which would feed a little bit of signal back into the Arduino. And the Arduino would then, uh, we had a servo um, motor, the servo would take up tension on the wire. <laughs> simple, right? I love I mean, it. Just, just simple. Um, so anyway, you know, it, you know, then jumping into that, then you have to start looking at um, controls. You know, how do you control this? How do you stop the... The, the system from you know oscillating and you know so you start to look at PID controls and all this sort of programming stuff so anyway I think that was about three months so that was about three months later had that little system developed um, and then we started to realize well you know as you you know we've got our tension perfect but um, you know the the wire inside the the phone as it cuts is actually cooled a lot more than the wires on the on the outside that's sticking out of the phone. So you start to get you know overheating. Your airfoil isn't you know perfectly right. So how how do you compensate for that? So we actually sat down and came up with a a little mechanical jig to um, stretch and change the thickness of of wire. So we started to go down this path of making custom custom um, wire um, let's say it was a meter long with uh, varying thicknesses along along the wire to allow for um, the resistance and the heat to be nice and even through anyway look, long story short it I've, I think it's, it's it got very convoluted it's been <laughs> it's been about um, about 12 years probably we're still I'm, I'm still got that project in the back of my mind but um yeah it just kept getting further and further and further away from from building a glider um it just became nuts um and you know then the laser the laser stuff came along we started to look at uh, there was some reason we needed a laser cutter for this whole thing because you just can't do it without a laser cutter um and yeah of course and uh, how can you live without a laser cutter <laughs> i don't know so yeah uh, he, how do you people live how do you do it i so, have three so we're, 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 we're here today and uh, i'm no closer to building this glider than i was you know when i first had had the idea <laughs> but i've sunk a lot of money Fair and enough. a lot of a lot of time um into this project <laughs> okay so you your glider and my robot arm are the same amount done <laughs> and we probably spent the, the same amount of time uh, but it was fun hey you know it was it was awesome learning all that stuff along the way um it just became a yeah just jumped into that rabbit hole and and kept going through little tunnels as 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 it went along that's amazing oh my god i can relate to that story so much <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 very like I don't know. It it seems to happen a lot whenever you learn a new skill, all of a sudden everybody has a use for that skill and you get distracted trying mm -hmm. to help everybody else now that you know this new thing. It's like when I when I first learn how to make a website, like I'll be damned if I didn't have somebody asking me twice a day, like, hey, can you make a site for me? And it's like, <laughs> I really just wanted to do this for myself. Like, I wanted to... <laughs> yeah. But, it, like, it, it can. It can get very distracting once you, like, once you feel like you've taken a step, it feels like you kind of get, get pulled over to a side staircase of, oh, now here's all this other stuff that you can do. <laughs> well, and it's like... um that video you showed me a couple of weeks ago, Chris, with the, the guy learning the kickflip. Oh yeah. yeah. He, he had the curve of knowledge and it was like at the beginning, you know, nothing. <laughs> so it's probably pretty easy. Right. Mm -hmm. And then as you're growing, you're like, Oh my God, this is, 
this is hard. And then you hit this point where like you you feel like you have all the knowledge and you're the the world's expert on this thing. Peak and Dunning you, Kruger. Yeah. And then you get like just a little bit higher and you're like, shit, I know nothing. <laughs> yeah. Oh God. <laughs> what did I, yeah. what was I doing giving people advice on their projects? <laughs> <laughs> there is uh, there's a good amount of people sitting at that valley where they think they know uh, everything and you'll yeah. you'll find the true experts are the people who will honestly look at you and go i know nothing but i will yeah. try and help you as much as i can I'll, i will give you the knowledge that i have uh, <laughs> and i'll tell you something there is there is no startup that has started up with anyone in any other position than that that they, yeah. they, that they, if you know everything, you just wouldn't do it. So it's the, yeah. it, it's the, it, it's the <laughs> ignorance about it that actually is what makes it successful. It's, it's the weirdest thing, you know. The dumber you are on, a, on, 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 just you know, not everything, but on some things, it's like, no, why, why can't you do that? Why, why, why can't that be possible? Um, well, I, I think that's kind of how innovation happens to a certain extent. Is like. You know, uh, a field stagnates for a while because everybody that knows everything just does it the way we've always done it, yeah. but, right? And, mm -hmm. and then you get this guy that's like, "Well, I think we could maybe do it this way," and he has no background in it, yeah, and no, no real like knowledge base to like base that opinion on. But they're like, "Yeah, we should do it this way," and then they do it, and then it works, and then that breaks the whole industry because everybody's just like, "Yeah, no." He's like, no. I, I didn't know I couldn't do that. <laughs> yeah. <Exactly. laughs> it, yeah. So I, I spent a lot of time trying to, when, when people come to us at, at, with like, completely wrong ideas, I try not to kill it because I'm just like, maybe they're right. Maybe it'll work. <laughs> and it, <laughs> so occasionally I catch myself in conversations and I'm just like, you know what? I have no input. I'm just going to walk away and see how this goes. And, <laughs> Yeah, I've been surprised a couple of times, but what what do you got, Aaron? Yeah, you have a project that you started and then it veered. I guess you do. Like you're yeah. working on that right now. Yes, exactly. <laughs> this has been like a project for like a year and a half now, at least. Mostly wow. just, yeah, most mostly just because it's so big. It it's yeah. it's covering, you know, electrical design. It's covering firmware on the controller on the sensor itself it's involving software um, for the server side potentially cloud stuff the way that i'm architecting it um if you're trying to sell like a localized product then you'd also have to deal with uh hard server hardware if you want like a local little server to do it but yeah so it's because it's so big and it's taken me a year and a half off and on you know i i stick with it for a couple months then it's like, well, it's getting a bit stale in my head. And then this new this new idea comes along or this new project and it's fresh and it's cool and new. So then you kind of jump to that. But um, right now, I, my resolution for this year was to focus on it because I really want to put my best effort into it. But, you know, like we discussed earlier, I'm looking into learning how to design my own PCB. But you know, if I really cared about getting it done now, I would just give it to someone right off the bat. But right. I just care about learning it because I want to be able to have that, you know, tool in my tool my toolbox. But I also see it down the road where I kind of want to also maybe 3D print the enclosures for the machine sensors. That, that would give me kind of con control over how the thing looks. And also, I can also like, manufacture it all at home. So I'm looking into doing a belt printer. And, and uh, for people who've been keeping up, uh, Carl just got the uh, the prototype uh, White Knight belt printer kit to print it solid. Mm. So print it solid now has the prototype kit for it. And they're going to start piecing it out, mm. figuring out where to source all the materials. So also a bit of sad news today. I just sold my Miata of five years. Damn. It's very sad. But I got enough money for it that I could probably afford the, the belt printer kit once it once it goes live. But that'll be like that's gonna be a whole new thing though, like belt printers. Like how do they work? It's like 
Learning Do all they that. Believe in their own magic. <laughs> <laughs> like having to learn all that and then get that stuff going just to make the thing. It's like I could easily just buy some off the shelf industrial, you know, electronics enclosure and white label that. But yeah. I kind of want to have the control over how the enclosure looks and also be able to can manufacture it all at home. And I can just have a belt to just spit them out 24 7. So it's like, yeah, I, I, I already foresee some more rabbit holes in this project that I'm going to go down. All the rabbits, all the time. Yeah. Does anyone see any rabbits <laughs> along the way? I never get to see the rabbits. They're always clear out before I get there. They're all in my yard. I, yeah, there's, <laughs> there's plenty of rabbits out here. The, the, the thing is, is there's not uh, a whole bunch of stuff killing the rabbits where you are. <laughs> Yeah, how big are the rabbits that survive in Australia? They, I know we talked about the deadly, deadly animals there, but they, you know, are they all the evil rabbit of Kyra Benora, like eating people's hearts out of their chests? No, no, no. In Australia, they're small. They're small, but they knew the name. (laughs) Yeah, I'm surprised you knew the name of that. (laughs) They're they're little. They're little, but they're but they're vicious. You know, not just not just they'll just take you out. Um, take your throat right out of your face. Oh yeah, even the fluffy ones are the worst. Too. The fluffy ones, just you know, with the big fluffy eyes, they'll just. That's how they get you, because then you pick them up and you put them right to your throat. That's it. And yep. then they're just like, ah. yep, yep, yeah, right. amazing. That's where I put all my rabbits. <laughs> well, it's because they're so soft. I just want to rub my face. Off. You, you got to put them within striking yes. range. That's the only yeah. way you can uh, you can get the proper cuddles. <laughs> That is straight up evolution right there. <laughs> <laughs> evolution is like, I'm going to make you snuggly. I'm going to give you big eyes. I'm going to give you soft fur. People will put their face right on you, and then you kill them. That That's is it. how you survive predators. That's it. Please. <laughs> please. <laughs> uh, I, I've talked about my main rabbit hole, which is, uh, you know, I, I started building CNC machines because I wanted to build a robot arm. And I, I think this year I'm going to like really start to dive into the robot arm because my, my main excuse for not was I, I wanted to wait until my daughter was old enough to like really get into the project. And now she's like the prime age. She's going to be 10 this summer and she's so into all this stuff. And they just, just like taking her to the makerspace to go pick something up. She's just jazzed the whole time. So uh, we're not even going to like pick up a tool. She's, we're just going to like get a box that somebody left for me. And I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Right now. Nope. Mine's at the prime age where it just takes all of my time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, when she was three, she was wiring breadboards with me. Damn. Uh, so like, you know, I got her started early. And she yeah. thinks I'm pretty cool, and I need to like, I need to capitalize on those years where I'm not terrible, and I'm pretty cool. Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I'm gonna do when I'm not. <laughs> so, but um, yeah, right now I think my my main rabbit hole that I'm diving down is like, I'm not happy with any of the CNC interfaces that exist right now, at least freely and open sourcely or freely and accessibly. Um, and I, I want to start working on that and like building an interface for a CNC machine that's approachable and uh, that anybody in our makerspace can just walk out to and be like, all right, I think I can figure this out. And poke a couple screens and get to the point where they can like cut a box out or cut a square out, cut a hole or do a whole pattern um, relatively easily. And my problem with that is I'm not good at software. <laughs> I'm bad at software. Like, so I am to a point in software where I am bad at it and I know I am bad at it. And that I think is a workable point because you can only get better from there. Right. Yeah. Like yeah. time and effort. <laughs> um, I, I've like gone past the hurdle of not knowing anything and having it being like something mystifying um, to like, I know that I, I can do things in it. It just takes me time 
more time than I feel like it should, and I'm not good at it. So, you know, maybe in six years, we'll have a really good software interface written by Joe. <laughs> and then in the meantime, like 12 other people have made something great. And that's better than good, right? It's a, tr it's a tricky one. It's like if <laughs> you can't even, you need to know something even to talk to people who know who you want to get to do this for you. So e right. e even if you... And I'm there. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, like um, you know, the, the PCBs, for, for example, if, if you want to talk to someone about designing a PCB for you, not you doing it yourself, you still need to know enough about it to talk the lingo and to, the, you know, to specify kind of what you need, what, what you want it to do, how you want it to work, all that sort of thing, and, and have a little bit of knowledge on what the limitations are. So, yeah. You know, it's a tricky one. You know, how far do you go? Do you go all the way and become a um, a UI programmer, or do you go enough of the way to know how to, um, you know, put your ID down in a in a in a format that you can hand off to a, uh, let's say, an uncreative programmer who can, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but someone who can just yeah. take your idea and do it and make know? it and make and, and make it without having to do the creative stuff. So it's. Yeah, it's a it's a tricky one. It is a tricky one, and it just it comes down to time, you know. If you are if you are a model, for example, you know how you know you could just sit there and and, and learn everything basically. Well, I'm immortal, <laughs> so that's what I'm gonna do. I, I, we just had a whole episode about sleep, where like I talked about where I was trying to sleep, and then I just threw that out the window this week, and I was like, I'm not gonna sleep at all, and I'm just gonna get everything done. How'd that work I saw, out for you? I saw a lot of YouTube. <laughs> I I found a new YouTube channel that I'm pretty into. And um, I caught up completely on my social medias. Didn't get shit done. Uh, I did get some things done. They just weren't the things that I intended on getting done. So this week I'm going to sleep and get things done. That's my proclamation for this week is I'm going to sleep properly and get things done. We'll see. <laughs> Best of luck. Yeah, yes. good luck. Hey, I, I wanted to, to, you know, we talked about these really long projects, right? Have you guys ever um, decided to, you know, whether it's you on your own or you with a, a partner or something or a team, just saying, look, we've got a week to do something or two weeks and just actually capping the time capping the time and see what you come up with you guys ever ever done that I, I know i've tried to do that in the past and it's and it just hasn't kind of worked out it takes a lot of discipline but i just wanted to get your thoughts it depends on, on your team yeah uh, <laughs> i can tell you that when uh i've had supervisors do that to me at work uh it was very dependent on who it was asking but usually there there were one or two responses one response was Yes, we will do our best and we can see what we can do and we will get as close to that goal as humanly possible, which is all I'll ever guarantee. I, I am not the type of person that's just like, yeah, we'll get that done because that's just a lie most of the time yep. or you're going to kill yourself. And yeah. And, and the other response that I'll give is uh, a, a resounding no. <laughs> It's <laughs> just no, we're not gonna do that. We will See, <laughs> But then it's usually followed up with we'll do our best. But it's like it, funny it you say that though. Cause like you put yourself in those situations. Like you'll Me? yeah, you will willingly put yourself in those situations, but you won't take that direction from others. Cause the the big thing that I was gonna point to was like we put ourselves in those situations, especially getting projects done before MakerFest. Right. Like the whole drift trikes thing was us giving ourselves a deadline and like, we've got to figure it out whether it works or not. It may just be sitting there, but we got to figure it out. Well, that's my problem with authority. I am contrarian <laughs> to the heart. <laughs> and that's, and that's why, like, that's why my, my response was, it depends uh, on who's asking, you know, uh, because like, so sometimes you will get the person who's who makes that deadline and they just have no idea on the amount of work that it will take, the te technical difficulties. 
et cetera, et cetera. They're just making an arbitrary deadline to create momentum. And to a certain extent, I can respect that. It depends on the penalties for not making the, the thing. Yeah. I, I, then, I, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. And, and then uh, the other one is you, you have like a technical leader that gets all of the limitations and gets all of this and is like, look, I'm going to make this deadline to put some pressure on us so we can get it done. And I think this is totally possible. I think this is a reasonable deadline. That's a little pressury to create some more momentum. And I completely respect that. And that's usually the, the guys that I'll, I'll be like, yeah, let's do this. We can get this done. Yeah. And I get all excited about it. I, I find um, sometimes I'll, I'll do this with my team. It, if if there's a project that's just been going on and it, it just doesn't seem to have a, a concise direction or time, I'll, I'll put a milestone in. And the milestone will be, you know, it won't be like crazy, but it'll be a ridiculous milestone. But the purpose of it is that we take a snapshot at the end of that milestone. So at the end of the milestone, we stop and we look at it. We go, OK, this this is where we are. This is what we've achieved. This is what we don't know. Um, these are the problems we've come up with and I, I guess in terms of a yeah in terms of a just sort of getting everything to head um, and people thinking they start to think about the the end goal um, a little bit more uh, it kind of works sometimes yeah. but yeah you're right it's got to be the right team and it's got to be presented in the right way um, yes you know like you, you you don't have a job if it's not finished it's probably not the right way um <laughs> Um, but yeah, you know, um, it's, it's kind of interesting. I, I've always wanted to set up a project for myself where, you know, we see all these things across Instructables. There was a really cool one, Joe, that you and I saw. It was a, it was a little thing that you throw a ball on and it catches the ball. Yeah. Ah, oh, that thing was just awesome. And I looked at that and I thought, ah, oh, but I, I could do that a little bit better and I can do that. And I thought, no, just, just make it the way it is, you know, it's done. Yeah. And then, and then, um, you know, rather than thinking about how you can do it better and turning it into a project that never will never end. Um, just, just in, like your foam cutter. Yeah. Just enjoy <laughs> it and make it. Um, did you ever think about that anymore? I, I've thought about that quite a bit, actually. Um, I, I love that little arm and, and just the idea like it, it was an arm that could sense how the ball was rolling on it. So as you, you, you dropped it, it was a platform that would like catch the ball and counter rotate the ball so that it would end up stopping and stalling on the platform. It's so neat. Um, I, I haven't given much thought to actually building one. Yeah. It looks, it looks too so good. much time right now. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I should. Yeah, that's something I should do. Uh, <laughs> it, like, like you pointed out, Chris. Like, I, I definitely do the deadline thing to myself, and and it's because when I create those deadlines, um, you know, especially for events, yeah, you know, it it's that pressure and the excitement that the pressure creates that drives me to to put the all nighters in and to put the effort forward to get it done. I, events are my main driver because I love being able to go to an event and, and be able to say like, yeah, I did that. And here's the hilarious story of how we got to this point <laughs> And here's why these crappy hacks are here. Yeah. Um, I, I get a kick out of telling those stories. One of the, like, the tool changer was the first time I was able to like finish something and not have 10 stories about really crappy hacks that I had to do to get it done in time because I just, we got it done. Yeah. yeah. Like it was kind of disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm starting to see uh, a pattern here. Yeah. It's starting to become really clear, <laughs> isn't it? Oh man. Yeah. That's not a good thing. Maybe I shouldn't be publicizing all of this onto the the world. <laughs> <laughs> but look, it's it's the stories that make it because everyone everyone does everyone goes through it. No no project is ever goes smoothly, and it's the you know it's the hiccups along the way that make it interesting. You know, it's like hey, yes. here's a toaster. There you go. Um, or you know, here's how we got to this. You know, um, that's yeah. kind of what makes it fun. I kind of regret not 
not um, recording or, or, or writing that down or, or you know documenting that along the way most of the time because there's so many crazy things that happen that you just you know just if you yeah. get, if you get documented or if you had a you know if you had someone following you around with a camera the whole time and just filming it all yeah you get some some beauties. I'm really mad at myself that I haven't videoed or like vlogged the process of building this router so far. And the main reason I haven't done it is because a good portion of the vlog would just be me cleaning up areas. So I had enough room to do the things that I needed to do because <laughs> my garage is super tight. Like, um, you know, there's so many tools in it. A long time ago, we said we were going to post pictures of our workspaces. We never did. Maybe I should do that now. Um, it would be the worst looking one uh, as it's ever been because there's this giant CNC router in the way now. But, um, you know, I, I didn't feel like anyone would be interested in me wa in watching me clean my garage as I built this thing. <laughs> you would be extremely surprised if you just went on Twitch and watched the stuff that people follow people for. It's... Dude, like one of the biggest channels, like it's not not one of the biggest, but a very big channel on Twitch is is a uh, metal worker who literally dragged a PC out into a forest and he has an entire kiln and everything set up in a forest. And so he just does metal working in a forest and it's freaking awesome. But he like just huge following. Like huh. you would you would be surprised at how much people want to see like just day-to-day -day making is, mundane is, tasks yeah people the internet's people a weird place <laughs> a lot of a lot of people watch the goldfish play pokemon oh, oh really? yeah yeah oh what? the goldfish playing pokemon was a great like <laughs> explain so somebody set up a um a tracker i think they used to connect and they basically mapped out a fish tank and they had the uh, the connect tracking the goldfish and if it went into a certain region then it would input that command into the game boy and so it had like all of this mapped oh out God. controls on the on the side of the tank and then it would just go around and it would like make random input commands into pokemon on a game boy and it was fantastic because you had no idea what was going to happen <laughs> And it was just a lot of times it was just the character spinning in circles and it was great. But then like sure not, if I remember right, the character did get to the second town and <laughs> did beat one battle. And so it was it was a whole thing. Like the the first battle it won, it was like, yeah, goldfish, like it won. But yeah, no, the internet's a weird place, man. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, all right. Oh, God, I still have so much beer left. <laughs> that sounds like a personal problem. It is. <laughs> I wanted to get things done tonight. All right. Um, well, we're well towards the end of the episode, and we've had some great discussion. Do you guys have any any projects towards the the topic that you want to add to? Um. Nope, I'm good. I'm going to finish it off with the greatest quote I think that has been said in in this recent generation. Don't let your dreams just be dreams. Ooh, that's a Do good it. quote. That is a good one. <laughs> Solid quote. <laughs> that, is, that is so good for our our message. <laughs> Don't get distracted. Do cool shit. <laughs> Or do get distracted because sometimes that's when the funnest things happen. Fair but enough. Make sure you're still doing cool shit. <laughs> Just do it. Just do it. <laughs> Dominic, uh, do you have anything to add? No, I'm good. I think it's it's been a lot of fun. I, I enjoy catching up with you guys. This is awesome. I, I'm glad that you were able to come on the episode and and enjoy it for a second time. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well. Uh, Aaron, you got anything? Nope. Okay. Well, with that, um, I want to remind you guys, if you've made it to the end of the episode, uh, 
the uh, Twitter poll for how you, we can make the show better is still out there. And we actually took input from some of the uh, responses that we had and we added them to this show. So uh, if you heard your input, yeah, we listened to you. You heard us or we heard you. Um, so yeah, give us input and tell us how to make the show better or, uh, you know, tell us you want to come on the show. Tell us that you're making stuff. Tell us about your projects, all the things. Um, with all of that, uh, this is Joe with makers on tap and you should keep making stuff. This is the end of the podcast.